Me before starting this video essay. I like Frozen. I'll defend it. Me after finishing this video essay. I think I'm obsessed with Frozen. Woohoo! Big summer blowout! It's officially been a decade since Frozen first hit theaters and took the world by storm. The franchise quickly became one of Disney's most popular and well-known IPs, churning record-breaking profits at every turn and cementing itself as one of the most successful films the company has ever produced. This success is not unwarranted. It's a really good movie, which is genuinely impressive when you take its tumultuous production history into consideration. Frozen was stuck in development hell for over half a century. The Snow Queen is a difficult tale to adapt in any medium. The characters aren't exactly three-dimensional, and while hand-drawn animation is gorgeous, it does have certain visual limitations. The decision to make Anna and Elsa sisters was frankly ingenious. Their relationship is the crux of Frozen's narrative, serving as both the driving force for the film's plot and the backbone of its motifs and themes. At the time of its release, Frozen was a unique breath of fresh air that was further accentuated by a fantastic soundtrack full of catchy and smart songs. So why is there a massive subculture dedicated to hating this movie? A particular fascination of mine is when the narrative surrounding a piece of media degrades to the point where it's rotten to the core. I've seen it happen to Romeo and Juliet, and I'm watching it happen to House of the Dragon, but Frozen should be the poster child for this phenomenon. People will regurgitate three or four variations of the same critiques and pretend that they're advancing the greater analytical discussion, but in actuality, their points are banal at best and regressive at worst. I'll watch a fellow reviewer and find myself asking the question, did we watch the same movie? Not everyone has to like Frozen, but it certainly deserves better than the faux, clickbait-inspired hatred this platform perpetuates. The worst crime this film is guilty of is becoming popular. British author and flaming homosexual Oscar Wilde once said, everything popular is wrong. He also said quotation is a serviceable substitute for wit, so just keep that in mind. Frozen was everywhere in 2013. There is virtually no escaping it, and that overexposure bred resentment in the collective consciousness. I'll admit, I got sick of Let It Go too, especially the Demi Lovato cover. Disney Channel played it constantly. This doesn't retroactively make the movie bad, but hating Frozen became an avenue for individuation, a way to stand out from the rest of the crowd. The broader question of identity is complex and requires an intense amount of self-reflection, but listing our likes and dislikes is simple. We treat our preferences like a form of shorthand for our personalities and values, but that resulting portrait is still an incomplete story. Moreover, hating Frozen became so common that this opinion lost its ability to differentiate people. When more and more critics spoke up about disliking the movie, this notion spread further and became somewhat mainstream. Herein lies a classic human contradiction. We all want to be seen as unique and special, but we also really like it when other people agree with us. There's this psychological phenomenon known as group polarization, the tendency for a group to make decisions that are more extreme than the initial inclinations of its members. It also asserts that a group's attitude towards a certain subject might strengthen or intensify after its members take part in a larger discussion. That's not to discredit people who hate this movie. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But I'm personally interested in the reasons why they dislike it, because some of their answers reveal a very shallow and disingenuous engagement with the text. So what are some of the things people criticize about this film? Oh, Anna. If only there was someone out there who loved you. I personally really like this reveal because it serves as a deconstruction of Anna's worldview and demonstrates the negative consequences of her isolated upbringing. She's extremely sheltered and lonely. So when a handsome prince comes along and says all the things she desperately wants to hear, she jumps headfirst into a relationship because she's looking for love in all the wrong places. You can't marry a man you just met. You mean to tell me you got engaged to someone you just met that day? Yes, pay attention. Christoph and Elsa's assertion that you can't marry a man you just met is indeed a metatextual reference to the rest of Disney's film library, but this particular stance was included here because Anna doesn't have a proper gauge for reality. Her engagement is an extension of her naivete, and the subsequent films that invoke similar fourth wall breaking references lack this sense of thematic purpose. I'm not a princess. <laughs> I'm the daughter of the chief. Same difference. No. If you wear a dress and you have an animal sidekick, you're a princess. Adaptationally speaking, Hans is the mirror from the original fairy tale. The devil, in the form of a troll, created an object that magnified people's worst attributes and failed to reflect beautiful things. Hans operates in a similar fashion. 
His personality is malleable, shifting and evolving whenever he interacts with different characters. He's openly hostile to the Duke of Wesselton. He's fearful and apprehensive when addressing Elsa, and up until the moment he betrays Anna, he appears to be as naive and charming as his fiance. I'm completely ordinary. That's right, she is. Uh, in, in the best way. Hans didn't start Disney's twist villain trend, but he definitely solidified it. This isn't unusual in the slightest. When an out-of-touch corporation strikes gold, they copy as many elements from their product as possible because they think those aspects are what contributed to the film's unprecedented success. But Hans wasn't the reason why Frozen became so popular, nor was the movie's commentary on past Disney flicks. The main selling point was, and still is, Anna and Elsa. That's no blizzard! That's my sister! Frozen is, at its heart, a story about sisterly love. Anna and Elsa were very close as children. They willingly shared a bedroom despite living in a massive castle, and Anna only ever saw Elsa's powers as an enchanting gift. This is amazing! The overwhelming sense of fear that would come to define Elsa's adolescence was imposed on her by both her parents and the trolls. An honest but major mistake nearly killed her sister, and this event drove a literal and emotional wedge between them. Conceal it. Don't feel it. Don't let it show. Once upon a time, there was a video on this platform that claimed Elsa was a terribly written character with no discernible personality traits. I forgot about this piece of trash. Elsa is a terrible character in every way. She is the dress, the hair, and the song. That's it. Elsa didn't learn shit. This character is bland at best and actively damaging at worst. I'm not bringing it up to be mean, but this kind of analysis deeply irritates me because, of course, the emotionally repressed woman who grew up repeating this mantra wouldn't exactly become the most effervescent individual. I swear, the discourse surrounding this movie makes me feel like I'm a crazy person. He's crazy. Another popular trend was to make theory videos about the origins of Elsa's powers, and though that topic led to some really fun content, the answer to that question is ultimately irrelevant. Elsa's ice magic is a metaphor for all the parts of ourselves we fear are inherently unlovable. The parts that will inevitably sabotage our relationships and trap us in an endless cycle of rejection and pain. The king and queen instilled this intense sensation of self-loathing in their eldest daughter, essentially teaching her that perfection was the only acceptable behavior she could demonstrate, and anything short of that metric was unacceptable. She can learn to control it, I'm sure. Let it go is an empowering anthem to a certain extent. Elsa gets to experience the freedom she's always craved and explores the powers she constantly suppressed. Her outfit transformation is a brilliant visual extension of her emotional state. First, she ditches the glove that's been handcuffing her for years. Then she unclasps her heavy cape. Purple is a color that's historically been associated with royalty. So seeing that symbol fly away in the breeze helps to broaden our understanding of her liberation. It's easy to get sucked into the song's powerful vocals and swelling instrumentation, but the final triumphant assertion of Let It Go basically translates to I'm better off alone. The cold never bothered me anyway. When the two sisters reunite at Elsa's ice palace, Anna's reassurances fall on deaf ears. Nothing can assuage Elsa's anxieties because she's spent a lifetime internalizing the notion that the best way to protect her little sister is to push her away. The soundtrack's opening number utters a foreboding warning to the audience. Beware the frozen heart. In a literal sense, this line foreshadows Anna's condition and the plot device that carries us into Frozen's climax. But there's a deeper meaning to it. The frozen heart represents the death of Anna and Elsa's sisterhood, and the loss of hope regarding their reconciliation. It's the acceptance of permanent estrangement. I'm not leaving without you, Elsa. Yes, you are. This is why the trolls are so freaking important. Fixer Upper keeps the spark of love alive. I'd insert the entire bridge here, but alas, copyright claims. We're not saying you can change him, because people don't really change. We're only saying that love's a force that's powerful and strange. People make bad choices if they're mad or scared or stressed. But throw a little love their way, and you'll bring out their best. True love brings out their best. Everyone's a bit of a Fixer Upper. That's what it's all about. Father! Sister! Brother! We need each other! It's fitting that Olaf gets the last solo line in this song, because he isn't just the comic relief character. He's the living representation of Anna and Elsa's childhood bond. 
a creation that shares Anna's innocent worldview while also embodying the positive capacities of Elsa's powers. Olaf is funny without being particularly annoying, which is a difficult feat to accomplish in a children's film. Fun fact, when Jennifer Lee took over as Frozen's lead screenwriter, her initial response after reading prior script drafts was, and I quote, kill the effing snowman. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. While we're on the topic of side characters, the only complaint I've seen directed towards Kristoff is that he didn't feature on any songs aside from Reindeers Are Better Than People, which is admittedly kind of odd. Jonathan Groff is an acclaimed Broadway performer. That kind of casting misuse would almost be as bad as hiring Jodie Benson for an animated movie musical and not letting her sing anything at all. In an interview from 2014, Jennifer Lee described Anna's character arc as a simple coming-of-age story, where she goes from having a naive view of life and love, because she's lonely, to the most sophisticated and mature view of love, where she's capable of the ultimate love, which is sacrifice. Anna's desire to see the best in other people is easily exploited, but it's by no means a weakness. Despite everything that's happened with Elsa, she still loves her big sister, and a pure display of affection is what saves the day. You sacrificed yourself for me? I love you. This is why I love and defend Frozen. There was a period of time when my older sister and I were essentially strangers who lived under the same roof. Middle school made her cold, and the reasons why eluded me. I missed my best friend, the girl who used to play with me every day. But with each passing year, I knew less and less about her. This divide lasted until we both reached adulthood. But Frozen gave me hope that we'd reconcile one day. And eventually, we did. The closeness we share now took years of careful cultivation. But all throughout our estrangement, the love was still there, and our bond endured. Love will thaw. Love. Of course. The process of rediscovering your sibling is weird and wonderful and exhausting and euphoric. I've jokingly referred to eldest daughter syndrome in previous videos, but Elsa is a textbook example of this phenomenon. She was forced to undertake several burdensome responsibilities at a very young age to try and shield her little sister from potential pain all the while suffering alone under the weight of her guilt. Her powers were treated like a problem that required intense micromanagement, hence why so many queer people found comfort in Elsa's character. She never needed fixing. Her powers are merely a beautiful extension of herself. The danger Grandpabi warns of lies not with Elsa's magic, but with other people's reactionary impulse to fear the things they don't immediately understand. Monster! Monster! These themes and ideas are what make Frozen so relatable. Almost every person on this planet has felt inadequate at one point or another. It's easy to dwell on our shortcomings, to compare ourselves to our peers, and to craft a false narrative of unworthiness in our heads. But there are people out there who will love and cherish every aspect of you. Leaving the door open for opportunities is terrifying, but the resulting rewards are incomparable. I like the open gates. We are never closing them again. To quote an age-old saying, comparison is the thief of joy. Speaking of which... Raise your hand if you've ever heard someone say, Tangled is so much better than Frozen. I have. Multiple times. People love to compare these two films, but I don't think that thought experiment is particularly interesting or productive. These movies don't have much in common aside from the fact that they share Disney as a production studio. None of the creative leads are the same, and their themes are wildly different. Tangled is about following your dreams and making healthy attachments and breaking free from abusive relationships, and it's great! Rapunzel is delightful. Flynn Rider is easily the best Disney prince. The music is lovely. I even wrote a parody song based on when will my life begin during a ridiculously slow day at my old job. Why do people feel the need to juxtapose these two great movies? The short answer is one of them became a recipient of mass attention and praise, and the other became somewhat of a footnote in pop culture. It's admittedly frustrating. We don't have control over what goes viral. No one is more painfully aware of this fact than me. But you won't win a badge of honor for resenting Frozen. Tangled is fantastic, but its capacity to churn a huge profit was hindered by its own budget. It's one of the most expensive films ever made, but it was still a success in its own right. Tangled Ever After aired before the theatrical re-release of Beauty and the Beast, and the franchise's artistic strides helped pave the way for subsequent productions, almost all of which are beloved. If you prefer Tangled over Frozen, that's awesome, but we shouldn't treat subjective opinions like they're objective facts. Different movies speak to different people, and I think that phenomenon is beautiful. 
If it's any consolation, they both got really crappy continuations. I woke the magical spirits of the Enchanted Forest. Okay, that's definitely not what I thought you were going to say. At its core, Frozen 2 is a movie about the inevitability of change. Relationships evolve, the seasons come and go, and our ability to adapt will be tested time and time again. This is a cool concept. It's not executed well, but I'll give them an A for effort. The songs are still really good, and Olaf is somehow even funnier than he was in the first movie. Well, at least they have their parents. Their parents are dead. The sequel has plenty of great elements, pun not intended, but the best way to describe its plot is reactionary. People wanted to know the origin of Elsa's powers, so that's what the story is focused on. Kristoff didn't sing much in the first film, so he gets his own psychedelic musical number in the second act. Seriously, Disney, what the hell was this? Now I know you're my true north, cause I am lost in the world. None of the character arcs feel satisfying or complete, but I respect the direction the filmmakers tried to take here. All three of our protagonists grew up in isolated environments, and that kind of upbringing can naturally lead to patterns of codependency. Kristoff doesn't know who he is without Anna, Anna doesn't know who she is without Elsa, and Elsa doesn't know who she is, period. She loves her newly assembled family, but a part of her longs to understand her true nature. The unknown is scary, but she's willing to make the journey, as is every other member of her found family. I'll drive. I'll bring the snacks! I don't dislike the North Aldrin plotline, but it really lacks a sense of cohesiveness. According to Frozen 2, you can't cultivate a future until you tend to the past. But also, if you learn too much about your past, you die. It's important to address the horrors of colonialism, but I don't think Frozen was the right franchise to deliver this message. Our mother was North Aldra. Sure, Jan. Personally, my biggest gripe with this film is how they handled Agnar and Aduna. To say that their parenting choices are questionable is a bit of an understatement, so forgive me if I don't enjoy the attempt to retroactively make them more sympathetic. The filmmaker's other reactionary choices are understandable and harmless, but the decision to flesh out the king and queen affects more than just the franchise's continuity. Their treatment of Elsa constitutes child abuse, and Frozen 2 completely ignores this. I'm not saying the film should have focused on this aspect of their relationship, but the willingness to brush it aside feels negligent, to say the least. So you're telling me that Elsa, a girl who grew up traumatized by the fact that she nearly killed her little sister, now has to live with the guilt of indirectly causing the death of her parents? Thanks, I hate it! Frozen 2 just isn't polished, but these rough edges make a ton of sense if you watch the production documentary on Disney+. Show Yourself is the movie's saving grace, but it's a miracle this song even made it into the final cut. In a bubble, this scene is fantastic. It's an organic continuation of Elsa's character beats a more mature version of self-acceptance than Let It Go, and a deeper exploration of the ideas introduced in Into the Unknown. The message it conveys is simple, but beautiful. Which is a breath of fresh air in a film that's fairly convoluted. I don't think that's gonna make any sense oh, either. Oh, a singing glacier! <laughs> Who doesn't have that problem? In order to understand Frozen 2's overarching shortcomings, we need to dissect the inherent philosophy of certain storytelling choices. Do you ever worry about the notion that Nothing is permanent? The unreasonably large whiteboard is back, baby! Throughout the movie, Elsa follows the call of a mysterious voice. Its four-note sequence is derived from the Dies Irae, a Latin chant that's typically sung in Masses for the Dead. This factoid helps foreshadow Elsa's death, nonsensical though it may be. It took the film's crew a long time to decide the voice's identity. Was it the predestined version of Elsa? Was it Atta Holland itself? Or was it the memory of her late mother? They eventually chose Aduna, and though that decision made the story functional, it's philosophically shallow. These three interpretations all stem from different thought trees. The first leans heavily on predeterminism, the philosophy that every event in the past, present, and future has already been decided for us. Some people find this belief comforting. I don't. Predeterminism tends to negate the concept of free will, how can any choice be meaningful if we were always going to make it? This thought process is also used to justify extended periods of suffering. If the voice had indeed been the predestined version of Elsa, then every horrible thing that ever happened to her would have become a series of necessary steps towards a future she could never escape. 
earlier drafts of Frozen 1 were actually dictated by predeterminism. There's a deleted song on the soundtrack called Life's Too Short. It's a far more hostile version of For the First Time in Forever's reprise that would have been sung during Anna and Elsa's reunion at the Ice Palace. Life's too short to even have you the lyrics frequently reference a prophecy that may or may not pertain to Elsa, and the repeated mentions of it send her into a fit of rage. Maybe you are the prophecy! I am not the prophecy! I'm glad the filmmakers chose a different course. The quality of both projects would have been severely hindered if they'd leaned into this predeterminist way of thinking. The second interpretation is probably the least coherent. Christopher Buck and Jennifer Lee almost changed the hook of Show Yourself to I'm Home, but the Lopez's pushed back against this notion because audience members probably wouldn't understand or relate to that revelation. The idea that Otto Holland's glacier is the source of Elsa's magic and powers strikes me as pseudo-transcendentalism, the philosophical belief that divinity pervades all of nature. To quote Ralph Waldo Emerson, In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. This narrative path could have provided some more clarifications on what it means to be the fifth spirit, but it wouldn't have wielded much emotional power. Oh, a singing glacier! <laughs> the interpretation they eventually chose is impactful, so long as you ignore several key tidbits of information. Iduna isn't a character, she's a plot device. She has one line in the first film, and her backstory doesn't provide any meaningful depth. If anything, it makes her seem like an even worse parent because Elsa's mistreatment is a direct contradiction to Iduna's heritage. In a vacuum, the revelation that your mother loves you unconditionally is breathtaking. But this movie isn't about reconciling with a parent who failed you. Addressing generational trauma was not yet the trend at Disney. Aside from an outfit change, Elsa remains static. She lets someone else tell her who she is. And within the context of existential philosophy, that's considered to be an act of bad faith. Meaningful relationships are important, but they can't define your identity. Case in point, look at Kristoff's arc in this film. Who am I? If I'm not your guy. A few moments later. My love is not fragile. You sure about that? In my opinion, the voice should have belonged to a past version of Elsa, the unfettered child who knew nothing of fear or expectations. Memory is a story we tell ourselves, a narrative that's doomed to be unreliable and incomplete. Holland should not have been a glacier. Ice is organized and inflexible. Life is chaotic and fluid. Elsa wants someone to tell her why she is the way she is, but she's the only person who's capable of answering that question. To quote the greatest motivational speech ever, of all time, it doesn't matter why you're here. What matters is that you're here. I'm a huge proponent of existential philosophy. It emphasizes the importance of free will and a person's role in determining their own development. Elsa knows how to love herself through other people, but true self-acceptance only comes after we reconcile with our pasts. By extending grace to our younger selves, we can start healing from old wounds. Trauma has the capacity to leave us frozen in time. Sometimes all we can do is the next right thing, but every choice you make is a step in a better direction, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem. This next choice is one that I Is Frozen 2 good? I honestly can't say. It features some cool concepts, but the final product gets bogged down by its own overabundance of lore and world building. The thing is, I've seen a better version of this movie. I know these concepts can be executed well because Balto 2 Wolf Quest exists. These movies are exactly the same. How has no one else noticed this? A character goes on a journey to discover her true heritage with the help of animal spirit guides. Her loving but reluctant family member joins this quest even though they don't fully understand it. The first film's love interest is completely sidelined. All of the musical numbers reflect on the nature of identity, change, and self-acceptance. There's a huge twist regarding a mother character, and the journey eventually reaches a bittersweet but optimistic ending where the girl finally finds the home she's always longed for. Does any of this matter? No. But it means we can use Balto 3 Wings of Change to predict the plot of the next Frozen film. This is no longer a video essay. This is a cry for help. Absolutely everything makes sense. Needless to say, this project spiraled wildly out of my control. 
I had no idea I was so passionate about this franchise until I sat down to write a script outline. I too suffered from frozen fatigue back in the day, but when I get burnt out on a piece of media, I just ignore it until I'm ready to revisit it with fresh eyes. Rediscovering this franchise was a lot like receiving a warm hug. Disney definitely overharvested people's patience with it. Placing Olaf's frozen adventure in front of theatrical showings for Coco was just plain dumb. But it's important to keep in mind that Frozen was the first ever Disney film to win the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature independent of Pixar. Money and accolades make the world go round. That's just the nature of our society. Open those gates so I may unlock your secrets and exploit your riches. Did I say that out loud? Popular things are easy to resent. But you know what people hate even more than trendy things? Children. Kids loved this movie, and they helped propel it to tremendous success. Jennifer Lee had to apologize to parents who came up to her and said, we're still listening to those songs with our children. A similar phenomenon occurred when Encanto hit Disney+. Plus. Olaf's voice actor Josh Gad admitted in an interview with Jimmy Kimmel that he finally understood why people hated Frozen so much, because his kids wouldn't stop listening to We Don't Talk About Bruno. To quote fictional character Rust Cole, time is a flat circle. Everything we have done or will do, we will do over and over again forever. Frozen receives a lot of flack, most of which is unwarranted, but something tells me this billion dollar franchise will manage to recover from your brilliantly crafted barbs. If your vendetta against this film is comprised solely of bad faith arguments that don't authentically engage with the source material, then my advice is to just let it go. So you're a writer? And that's the best pun you can come up with. I thought sisters are supposed to be supportive. That is support. Hey sis, I want not a sound out of you. This video was brought to you by my patrons. If you're interested in enabling these descents into madness, please consider pledging. I would deeply appreciate it.